Hello everyone and welcome back to our Birds and Albion England DNA series. We've got something quite interesting today. We're going to look at a document I referred to quite a bit of time ago in the series actually. I mentioned that um, while I was with one of my, my academy teams, we played another academy away. And this academy had a template, like a player profile template of the type of player that they have for their younger players. And I thought we'd review that. I was able to cut off the edges so you can't see what team it is which is what I was more concerned about. So I think it's it's okay to show. It's also quite a few years ago at this point. So um, yeah, but, and it's also, it's up on, in their change rooms in in the within their training facility. So it's not like it's trying to be hidden, of course. But yeah, I thought I'd show it to you anyway, so you can sort of see, I guess, how players are categorized by at least, at least one club. And uh, yeah, let's go through that. Let's look at that together. And then today also, in terms of FM, we're in the playoff race and we might have just got a top level winger. And welcome back everybody. So let's have a quick look at this then. So this is a player behavior model and what this essentially does, it sort of breaks players down. And people really, like, you'll look at this and you'll think to yourself, there's somebody that you've worked with before, maybe you went to uh, school or college, university with, somebody that you know that falls into one of these four categories, right? Maybe a blend of two, maybe. And, uh, yeah, let's go through it. So they've got a spectrum of attitude on, on the left that goes low to high up on the left-hand side, and energy that goes high to low. So you can see here at the bottom where it says low to high that somebody's actually gone with a marker and wrote high and low and switched in. Now, I think that's right. I think that they're supposed to be flipped. I think energy is actually showing the wrong way, but we'll go through it together anyway. So player or personal behavior model from this football club. This football club is a team not in the Premier League, and I believe they're a Category 2 academy, so... That's the information I will give you, is that much. Uh, personal behavior model. So, if a player is a spectator in that category, so they go through the motions, all the best, talks to a game, sits on the fence, laid back, Mr. Nice Guy, that's somebody who's a spectator, and that they fit into to that category there. I think that's like supposed to be the neutral score, the neutral kind of, uh, kind of player. Although it's not quite really good, good, bad, really bad. I don't think it's quite like that, because... I mean, maybe it is, and this is supposed to be the, the second good one, but it's, it feels more neutral to me, really. But there we are. Then you've got victim on the bottom left here. So victim is depressed, grey. This is pointless. Why change? It's not fair. Constantly moaning. Blame culture. So um, if you've coached before, you're going to start to think of players that sort of fit. You can sort of almost picture them and hear them in these sort of like categories here. And you've got cynic, who is, uh, it says terrorist, envious. So yeah, I... I think the word terrorist isn't quite the right word for this. I don't. I don't think that word really fits with. I just think you could use a different word for, for that description. But anyway, cynic that says terrorist slash envious, which is the green color here, bottom right. Uh, two faced, negative comments, bully, sarcasm, gossip stirs, big time Charlie. So, yeah, that's again. That that's obviously one of the one of the worst ones. In fact, it's probably is the worst one, isn't it? Those are the people that that um, I guess don't take much pride in the team winning if they're not winning, those kind of things, right? Somebody who's really in it for themselves and that kind of stuff. And then you've got the player. So the champion's goal. So the player is the one you want. The proper player walks the walk, team player, makes decisions, shares in success as well as a setback. Exactly what we just said a second ago. Goes the extra mile, often sacrifices social activities, ambitious. So they've sort of got you to think about where you fit. Now, I don't know if they've reinforced this to the players. I didn't work at this club. I don't know how much they really show it to the players, but just allowing players to sit there or stand there before training and read this will make them think which one they fall into. And they'll recognize their own behaviors. They definitely will. Even quite young, they'll realize that, that the cynic, for example, is one of the bad ones. And they'll realize that if they are two-faced or if they are negative or if they do, you know, bully some of the players in the team, they'll know they fit into that category right. And um, yeah, I don't know how much they use it, whether it's just like that, whether it's like they do a big presentation saying, here's, here's the players that came through this academy. Um, here's the players that come through other academies. Here's where they would fit in the spectrum. And here's where we expect you to fit. I don't know how any of this is used per, per se. I just thought this would be something quite interesting to share and to show because when I saw it the first time, I thought it was quite interesting, especially how they broke down the players into these, uh, these categories. But like I said, it doesn't have to be cat uh, players that you can put into these categories. You could put work colleagues, family members, friends, anything you want, right? Anything that's in a group environment, you could sort of probably apply at least some of this to. So 
yeah, interesting. So you want somebody with a good attitude, high attitude and high energy. So so you would assume that attitude is correct in its high low, uh, the way that it's, it's sort of moving with high at the top, low at the bottom. Energy, the direction of energy with high and low. I think that's probably wrong just because when you've got player the champions, when you've got the, the gold, the gold standard player right there, it's just got low energy if you're following the spectrum, which I don't think is quite right. Uh, but the, And also I think low should probably apply to what they've got down as the victim um kind of i guess player profile so yeah interesting to see how other clubs do things this was quite a few years ago and this was what this has been 2019 maybe 2019 i might have seen this so a few years ago the people at the club don't think work there anymore anyway so it could have completely changed there was a pretty notable player that came through this academy though so who knows but there we are anyway i just thought i'd share it with you do let me know your thoughts on this behavior model. See what you think of that. And yeah, I, I guess the one thing that we don't know is we don't know how much is really used. So it's hard for us to really comment on how effective it is, whether it's good or bad. Uh, just, yeah, just thought I'd show it to you. That's how another club breaks down their player profiles, at least for young players in any case. So back to Foot Manager then and back to the series. We are currently eighth in the league. We are currently six points off of the playoffs. We're going to probably fall just short, I think. And uh, you're not going to join me back right now for the game. We're going to skip a few matches still yet, but that is how things have gone in terms of results. Uh, pretty good overall. It's still like we are on, I think we're on the same points we finished on last year already. So, yeah, exactly, actually. We're still, you know, a good eight games left to play, which is going to be pretty, pretty good. Uh, top performers, I think Aaron Oxby's finally starting to come into his own. He's starting to score goals on a regular basis, which is nice to see. He's improving, which is good to see. And I've been quite impressed with him. Brennan, who's the 14 assists so far, is looking really impressive. I think Dylan Wilson's pretty good. Like, he's effective when he plays. He's not quite the best, most effective player in terms of attributes, but he's pretty good. He's pretty good. Lee Burley, I'm massively impressed with. He's probably the best midfield player we've got to play in the pivot role. And I don't think I would move him from that position for quite a while. He might need to work on his pass. He's really working on it as well. So, yeah, maybe that's the thing to look for, but really good player as well. Steve Torrance slowly improving, looking really good left backers as well. Um, we're not going to do a proper review just yet. We'll do it at the end of the season because it makes more sense in terms of actual like player attribute development. Just give me a few little things. What that's interesting. I don't think Holder's played that well, but he's got six goals and seven assists. That, and he's improving, so you never know. Could be a good player. But the reason I brought you back today is we have got our youth into, which I actually missed a couple of days ago. And they've played their match against the 18. So here is your youth intake for 2033. And your first player is Abdi Banim. Now, Abdi Banim is a winger. And ladies and gentlemen, we might actually have a winger for the first time in the series. We've got a winger that could be really, really good, really fast. So his birthday's the 1st of May. So he's going to be turning 16 in a few, in two months' time. So he's going to have a youth contract that first year. So it's, it might be tough to use him in that first season, but. Needs must sometimes, right? We just have to throw him in, I think, because he's better than what we've got already, I would say. He's he's arguing our best winger now at 15, so there's that. Secondly, we have Zach Powell, who's a winger, and he's not quite as good. Hopefully he develops into a good one, but he's probably what I'd expect to come through the academy. Like, not very good. And yeah, he could develop into a good winger if he gets enough attributes up in the right areas. He could, but he's nowhere near as good as uh, the previous player, is he? So... And that's it. Jordan Riley's terrible. Everybody else is terrible in this youth intake. This youth intake is one first team player, potentially a squad player, both as wingers and anything else, which is fine because we've got everything else right now that we can, we can sort of deal with. If it does this to me every year, it can give me a first team player in a position and a backup to go along with it. I'll take that. Every year I'll take that and nobody else will take that because that'll get us through what we need to, we need to get through. And uh, yeah, but for now, that's all we've got. Literally, I could just show you quickly. Look, there's, uh, this guy's okay. He's maybe like a fourth choice goalkeeper. Who knows? I mean, it's, yeah, it's just not great, is it? It's not, it's not great. So there you are. That's your youth intake for 2033. Pretty, pretty quick, that one. And uh, yeah, I guess what I'm going to do now, I'm going to play some matches off camera. I'm going to definitely play the next two. So I'll play Luton, I'll play Barnsley. I might even play Wigan. I'll just see how things are going. We'll come back for maybe the end. Maybe we come back for like Sunderland and West Brom Portsmouth because I think we hopefully will be within six points going to the last three games. If you can get to the last three games, anything could happen because Sunderland are currently seventh. West Brom are bottom of the league. That could be potentially... If we can win the first game, that should be a win. Then it goes into the last game. It's Portsmouth. So, yeah, let's plan to come back for the Sunderland game, but we'll see what happens before that point. Um, if it goes really badly wrong, what I'll do is play load the youngsters until the end of the season and we'll review it all together. But, yeah, that's going to do for now. You come back and join me in a few more days. Well, a few more weeks when we come up 
against Sunderland at home. Hopefully with a chance to get into the playoffs. It's very, very close. We are six points away. We just faded away, didn't we? Got a draw and a loss the last two games. That was a bad draw, really, for a derby game. But uh, yeah, we'll see how we get on. Okay, I'll see you in a few weeks. Hopefully we are still in with a chance to get ourselves into the playoffs. And welcome back, everybody. It finished off with us falling just a bit short of the playoffs in the end, which is a bit disappointing, but expected. I always thought we were going to finish just short. And the reason we fell off so far was because, like I said, I was going to play a, um, a rotated side if the it looked like we were going to be way off the pace. And basically what happened here was we got to the Peterborough game. Once we lost that, we were over 10 points behind and we just played one of the teams we needed to leapfrog. That was an opportunity really to get condense it down. I think it was then 11 or 12 at that point, the point. So yeah, not ideal, but uh, but we ended up on a on a good win. We scored a lot of goals towards the end of the season. And you managed to finish the season with a lot of obviously goals being scored, but also having a lot of young players playing, which was really good and important. Players such as Kojo Kwame, uh, Gareth Miller got some minutes. We got him into the team as well, which was good. And other players that didn't really play that much. Players like Jordan Rowlands, who didn't quite play as much as maybe I'd like, but he's still a good young player. Sam Heller got some minutes towards the end. We gave John King a run out. We scored a few goals actually towards the end, so fair play to, to, to John. And uh, yeah, I think we'll start off. Let's start off by reviewing some of the stats. Then we'll do attributes, and then we'll finish off with... Uh, the end of season review, of course. Yeah, wherever I go here, I'm in the way a little bit. So I'll just stay in the corner a little bit here. And uh, yeah, I'm basically blocking the two or the, the three goalkeepers plus Mitchell King is this player here. So for future reference, that's what we're, uh, we're going to be doing. So I'm blocking off Mitchell King and that's three goalkeepers, just so you are aware. So look at this. If we go through like our main centre backs that we use this year. So let's have a quick look at... Uh, the boys, let's not really pick out the players. Didn't really play, maybe. One, two, three. We'll go Torrance being four. Yeah, those four. I mean, looking at some of this. So look at the stats. And you've got Mitchell King on dribbles per 90 of 1.96. That's probably the biggest I've ever seen. That is the largest dribbles per 90 I've ever seen for a centre-back, even in the back three in FM. So that's pretty impressive. And then Torrance is 1.49. So it shows that we really do need... Well, don't need because Mitchell King has only got... What's he got? Seven dribbling? Seven dribbling. And yeah, he was able to do that. So maybe we need, if we can get a fullback that can play centre back on about eight, nine, ten dribbling, maybe it could be not that they're going to get more dribbles per ninety. That's quite a lot, but they're going to be more effective when they do dribble with it, perhaps. So let's then compare that to a bit of open blokey passes per ninety. So Mitchell King's the he's the highest on that as well. What else we've got? I've got anything else we can look at? Chances created per ninety. He's the only one with the chances created. That's quite impressive, you know, from him. Pretty good in possession. Progressive passes. Scott Reigns is by far the most on 8.02. Uh, Torrance on 5. So it looks like we seem to pass a bit more on the left and we jump more on the right. That could just be the players. It could also be the tactic I was in front of them. So there you are. Interesting there. Tackle win ratio across the board is in this. Most in the 70s except for Torrance is on the 80s. Header 1 ratio. Only 65% Torrance. 45% for Rainsford. That is criminal for a centre-back, of course. All of those four played over a thousand minutes as well, which is nice. In terms of pivot players, we've got four listed here. Open play key passes is pretty even across the board. 1.08 to 1.27 being the largest in favor of Rollins and uh, Giannis being the least there. What about progressive passes? We've got seven for Sam. That's pretty good. 5.34 for Giannis. Triples per 90 goes to Giannis as well. Uh, Tackle win ratio. We've got a 79 to 68, 71 to 66. Not very good from Roland, considering he's the more defensive one. Interceptions per 90, 1.75. Yeah, that's that's pretty close. Again, I don't know if it's that high, but it's close. Header one ratio, lead early 23%. Not great, but he's only 5 foot 5 playing central field, of course. So it's expected to, uh, to a degree. Number 10, like actually playing in the number 10 role. I mainly use these three players. So let's have a look at this. Open play key passes per 90. Brendan Hughes with 2.04. Uh, Stephen Hughes, 0.79182 for Dylan Wilson. So those two are quite close. And then Brennan Hughes is the one that pulls away a little bit in there. Dribbles per 90. Again, goes to Brennan Hughes. So Brennan Hughes is looking, let's say, chances created per 90. Yeah, but well, no, Dylan Wilson's pretty on that. So judging on that, you probably would say that Brennan Hughes and Dylan Wilson are maybe the two better players to play together. And we can move Stephen Hudson back. Is that an option next season? Maybe, do we think? Not sure. It's close, though. Head on ratio, I mean, it's terrible for Brendan Hughes and for Dylan Wilson. It's only Stephen Hudson who can do a bit there. That's interesting. Let's have a look at wingers. Dribbles per 90, Ian Lockwood 3.09, Polo 
three, six, Helder, 1.94. It's quite a difference between Helder and Ian, considering they both played mostly on the same side. Uh, Tom Keenan, not very much either, as a defensive winger. Okay, that's interesting. Actually, no, no, it does make sense. Actually, no, Keenan and Helder played mostly on the same side. It was Polo and Lockwood, so that no, does make a bit of sense there. And then look at chances created per 90. That goes massively towards Helder, with Polo being second. And they both played opposite sides. That's not to do with the side that you're on necessarily that. And uh, yeah, open by key passes goes to the two players. Oh, no, again, that's, that's quite a split, actually. Okay, that's interesting. So the, the side didn't really show which player is which, really, in that in instance. So they did switch quite a lot during game stuff, right? And then striker, really, it was just two players. Let's have a look here. Open by key passes. Don't really care about that. What we're looking for here. Conversion ratio goes to John King by quite a distance. Non penalty XG per 90 is exactly the same. Uh, shot target ratio goes by a percent to John King. Uh, let, do you know what? For these two in particular, let's just get the striker view out and see what it says for us. Uh, minutes per goal goes to John King by quite a distance. 170 for Aaron and 109.50 for John. Extra performance minus 3.5. No, that's not very good for Moxby. He needs to do better than that, to be honest. Does need to do better. And uh, dribbles per 90, 0 0.70. Exactly the same for both of them. Like, if you ignore the age of the two pliers, you'd probably say that John King's a better plier if it was a money ball save, but it's not a money ball save. We can see the attributes. Iron Oxby is by far the better prospect, so obviously we'll be sticking with him, but John King's a good backup according to that. Okay, let's now look at some player actual uh, attribute reviews. So we'll start off with the goalkeeper. In the last year, he's got a plus one for composure, looking pretty good. Mitch King isn't much to show. I don't think Carl Andrews got much to show either the last 12 months, so there you go, nothing really there. Scott Rainsford, let's have a look at him. How's he developing? I think he's starting to stagnate a little. Looks like it's the case. And let's have a look at Steve Torrance, who should be showing a bit of progression and is showing signs of progression, which is good to see. So look at some youngsters here. Stephen Ford, who just got promoted to the first team. He's improving nice, nicely there. Gareth Miller, how's Gareth looking? Is he looking good? Could maybe do with a bit of improvements here, Gareth, but we'll see going into next season. Lee Burley has had an unbelievable year yet again, and he's still improving, still looking pretty good for us in a lot of instances. Jordan Rowlands has been improving nicely, but hasn't got as much game time towards the back end of the season, so I have to work on trying to get him into next season. The two wingers look at Lockwood and Helder. So Lockwood not really doing much as he at the moment, and Helder was improving. He's improving again now. A couple of plus ones there for him. Look at a few of the tens. Let's have a look at... Uh, we've seen Brennan quite a lot, so let's have a look at... Dylan Wilson. Brendan's basically not, not improving. He's not going down. He just ain't where he is. Dylan Wilson is improving still, which is good to see. He needs to get a bit quick, a bit more agile. His acceleration agility was pretty poor a few years ago, but he has worked at it, and he has improved. Kojo Kwame has been here for a year now. Over the year, not really improved much, has he? But uh, he's probably going to be the first team squad. He might even start next season, so there is that. I think he's got it, really. He's just the best player on paper, I think, at this point. He's got to go straight into the first team. And that is pretty much it. Oh, of course, Aaron Oxby. How could I forget? And last 12 months, there you go. Plus ones everywhere. His first touch has just got up to 17, although it doesn't display a plus one. It has just got up to that as well. So looking very, very good. I'm going to do everything I can to prevent him from leaving as well, of course. Alistair Bevan's still on a bloody youth contract, which is so annoying, but he's improving nicely still as he goes. Is anybody else's seventh year? John Logan, do we need to look at him? Not really. There's not too many other prospects to, I guess, look at too much here. Is anybody else in the 21s? I mean, Fenton Sang seems to go through spells for, like, proving loads, then sort of plateauing off. And then last month, it's Leighton Wilder. We'll look at him improving a little bit. Okay, so there you go. That's your, that's your youngsters. That's your team. And your attributes sort of review, I guess, for some of the uh, the players. Players I've not shown you are the players that just every year don't move anymore. Sam Heller's one. Let's look at Sam Heller. I mean, there might be one thing that's moved. No, nothing. Yeah, he's, that's it. Sam Heller's Sam Heller right at this point. So there we are. Okay, I'll see you in a few seconds then for the end of season review. Okay, we go then. End of season review the new arrivals. Obviously, there's none of those. Results, yeah, finishing 11th was pretty good. Major step on the last season, finishing on 55. So 11 point improvements. Uh, some moments there. Finances, generally looking looking better. I just offered out a load of new contracts. So let's see how that affects finances going forward. We've got players signed on for quite a few years, though. That was your best team. That was the best team. These two should be switched around. Apart from that, that's, that's, that's correct. We've got Oxby for three more years, guaranteed. That's his contract. I just think that the interest of the clubs is so big. Would it, it would almost have to get promoted this year, then survive with these the second year, and then maybe we could get him a new contract. By that time, maybe like, what, 21? Maybe other big sides don't want him by that point because he's not quite a wonder kid anymore. But 
who knows. Fans for the season was Brennan Hughes. Young player of the season was Stephen Hudson. Goal of the season was Lockwood. Top goal scorer was Oxford with 18. Most of this was Brennan Hughes with 6. That's just pretty good, that is. Most of the match awards goes to Brennan Hughes. That's pretty good. Most league goals by a player at the club is now John King all-time in the league for Burton Albion with 145. Dominic manager Simon, anything on this for us? Uh... Uh, just on the mark, just just for doing all right. Iridox, we did end up in the next gen award as well, but didn't win it. And that is your end of season review. So everybody that was on a contract expiring soon, have, they've all got three, four or five year contracts and every single one of them has got another three year option extension by club on top of that. So that is what we've got. William's got one year left. I'm just letting it run down. I might just let him go. I'm not quite sure yet. Doherty's got two years. That seems about right. After two more years, he's probably going to be not quite good enough, I don't think. But we'll uh, we'll see. Maybe. Maybe if he gets working a bit of that, we'll have to, we'll have to find out. But yeah, most of the players got at least three years left on their contract. But yeah, a lot of these players here, you can see, have got a lot of tag-ons to their, to their contract. So that's good to see. The ones that have got release clauses, I've just set the valuation slightly lower below their release clause so nobody activates it. And we can just keep dragging out the transfers every year. And hopefully we can keep these players, but we'll have to see. But that is going to do this part of the episode. I will see you in a few seconds for you. But for me, it could be could be tomorrow. I don't know what it's going to be. Could be I think it might be tomorrow. I think tonight I might stream. It's getting a bit late. Might have to get some time into stream. But I'll definitely come back and record this tomorrow. So overnight, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, put the schedule together again as usual. I'm going to probably going to copy the same schedule. I know we had a bad run in April, but this time it was because I changed players. It, you know, we actually beat Wigan, and we actually played pretty well in some of those games as well. I think the first team I got results there. So I'm going to go back through and copy the exact route that I had, exact schedule that I had this year is going to go in next year as well. So we're going to go through the same exact thing. And I think it was months five and six, wasn't it, that I picked? Months uh, five, six that I threw in and making sure that I just I mixed up the in possession, out possession. But uh, yeah, that's what we're going to do. Okay, I will see you then in a few moments time and we'll see how the season started. Again, we'll probably come back about 10 games in, something like that, so you can see how it started. And we'll play a few more games then at, at that point. Maybe play two matches instead of the three. Who knows? But uh, yeah, okay, I'll see you in a few moments. Let's see how we're getting on. Hopefully the boys have got to a good start because we got to this stage before, didn't we, where we just missed out on the playoffs with the team. And then we lost Justin Parker Trot and it all fell apart. This time, if we lost, if we did lose Oxby, I still think the team would have a chance because I think that Kwame could be good enough to replace him good enough potentially that's my theory but the rest of the team has to play well again my actual current concern isn't striker anymore my concern is center back because i feel like we've really got three center backs that can play and then we're sort of in trouble so maybe not rainsford either rainsford's not even counting that really so those three plus rainsford's okay but maybe tom stevenson four becomes good enough hopefully so we'll have to throw him into the team we'll have to see but uh yeah quite a few players with options for us to to throw in and if we're going to be in a playoff race it's really hard for me to go Tom Stevenson for you you're playing centre back you're going to go in first choice because we're probably not going to go up with him he's going to make mistakes he's going to get overrun and it's just general pace and agility and things like that and in addition to his mentals being low it's going to cost us goals but we'll see what happens but I'll see you in a few weeks anyway hopefully we've done well in the summer a good preseason, no injuries and hopefully we're going into season pretty fresh we'll see you in a few moments so let's see how we're getting on be able to go in and play these games and you're going to come back and draw me about 10 games into the season and welcome back, everybody. So you would say, right, Jack, do you know what? 15th mid-table, that isn't too bad, you know. You've not had too much of a, of a bad run there. Like, you're only six points off the playoffs. It's okay. It's not great, but it's, it's, it's okay. Nah, it was it was absolutely terrible. It was really, really bad off camera. We actually lost quite a few in a row. And, yeah, I changed tactic initially to the the, the 4 2 the Manchester City 2011-2012 kind of tactic. We got the win there, and then we lost 5-0. And I decided that, so if you imagine like a tactic of the five vertical lines, like across the pitch, that I feel like we needed players that can defend in the wide ones, in the wide zones, because the, the way the match engine sort of works with us, that we either need to have a tactic that has fullbacks and wingers ahead of them to be able to help them defend in those sort of wide areas, or a tactic that just has, that just has wingbacks, in a, like a back through the wingbacks, right? So I felt like that watching the way we were conceding goals, I was like, yeah, we could probably just make it work without without doing that. But I feel like that we needed to do that with this team. Uh, as a huge underdog team with no pace whatsoever, I feel like we needed to do that to keep things consistent. Like with the pep tactic that we had, with the three at the back, we could like beat a team 3-4-0 you know, at home. But in the next game, you know, it's like they, they get that same chance no matter how well we play. That sort of in-between 
in the half space between like the the side centre back and where a fullback would be. They always get that sort of chance in every match. If they score that first chance, you could lose the game quite easily. So I feel like we need to sort of negate that if we could. And uh, yeah, so I went to the four two three one as you can see here the, from the Moneyball series with with Paris FC. This is the Moneyball tactic because I felt like the it was actually quite a good tactic and it played really good football and it fit the England DNA pretty well. But that's not what we're going to play today. What we're actually going to do, what we're going to do is play the pep tactic, but like the defensive version of it, right? Where we would to go out and see out the game. And I said a few times that I thought this tactic could be quite good as a starting tactic, but we'll have to we'll have to wait and see and find out how it how it sort of plays. But uh, yeah, that's. But that's what we're going to do. We're going to see how this tactic works, the pep tactic with this sort of system. Now, it's a system that we played at the start of the save, obviously, very close. But the whole playing philosophy is completely different to that. It's way more focused on playing out from the back and possession base, etc. The playing philosophy stays exactly the same. We're just moving the two wide players into the wing back roles and using it as a for us. It's now a three four two one, for example, right? So that's what we're gonna we're gonna do here. Now, like my analysis of like how we start these seasons is is it comes down really to us those first few matches. Now. Basically, we need to win two of the first four matches, I think, to have a good a good chance in any season with this team. And the reason is we're a huge underdog, right? And it's not that we need the full morale boost to do well, but we can have it low for us to then try and struggle through matches, right? Like, we don't need to have good full morale for us to be able to succeed, but we can't have bad morale, you know? So we, we can't lose, uh, like, three of the first four league matches, right? We, we just can't afford to do that and put us in a bad rut going into the other games. So... That's what happened. And uh, yeah, we'll see how we go on against Plymouth. We're going to play this tactic against them. And uh, yeah, we're going to, we've got Brennan Hughes suspended, which isn't, sorry, not suspended, injured. So that's going to be a slight, slightly difficult thing for us. But that is going to be your team. And I wanted a tactic where I could also get Kojo, Kwame and Halder into the same team. So this might help us out, but we'll see how they get on anyway uh, in this one against Plymouth first. So Plymouth is the easy game for us in this, in the sense of the next few matches. Plymouth uh, at 12th. We're going to play Plymouth. We're going to probably play the Peterborough game. I don't know if we'll play the Wigan game. We'll see, we'll see what happens in these first two matches. We'll play, P we'll play uh, Plymouth and Peterborough for definite. So let's get into the game and see how we get on with the, the new sort of tactic, the pep tactic with the three at the back version. Assistant manager just says, we're good run. Keep going. Okay. So there's a couple of things, I guess, to look out for in, in this game. One is that uh, we... We obviously were doing this tactic without any notice sort of thing. So Plymouth are going to be not ready for us to play this this exact tactic formation. Also, they're playing quite a unique kind of system here, like unique formation. So but you're not going to come up against us, are you, too often against the AI. So they might, that might play a factor in as well. We've got to be careful, I guess, both those things. If uh, if we win the game anyway, that is. Carl Andrew plays it into Giannis. Giannis plays a pass out to Helder. He's got a bit of time and space. Plays it back to Mitchell King. Uh, takes some touches, plays inside to Luke Norwood, goalkeeper. He's going to play it back out to Tom. It's good, patient build-up play from the boys to Burley now. Burley goes wide, plays it back. See, maybe that's where he needs to be right-footed. Like, he needs to be... Because really, that's... Although we're playing like a back through the wing-back, he's not really wing-back, is he, in possession? He's like a winger for us. We're just playing him as wing-back. So, like, I want him to drive inside, really, there. So, maybe in the second half, we take Burley out of that position. And we put him maybe in the pivot role and put somebody else out wide. Brings him off the bench. Ian Oxby's going to go up for that. Heads it towards goal, heads it over the bar. Yeah, Kinnan's got a bit of a knock. So let's do this. Let's go for the fans. Let's take him off. Let's put Hudson up. We'll move those two across. Let's put on Ian Lockwood on the left-hand side and see how that goes. Oh, here, Plymouth throw it down the line. We're going to get up to this, are we? Not quite. We are now, though. Torrance is going to get to this nice and easy and plays it into Hudson, who loses the ball. Um, he's going to win this back. He does win it back, though, at the very least. He's going to try and keep this in. Nobody's pressuring, luckily. Uh, plays a really ambitious switch to nobody. Or to cram a bit in the air. Like, what is that? Why would you even try that there? Just stay on it. Like, loads of time and space. Torrance gets it back. Luckily, they're as bad as us at this point. Good play up to the goalkeeper. I got loads of time and space on the right-hand side. Get up the pitch. Good. That's better. I'm going to get up higher. No. What are we doing here? Okay, well, we're going to get away with it. Kami goes through. He's not going to score from there. Is he? Oh, he does. He still scores. Give me 1-0 to Burton Albion. We'll take that. Like, we have got 58% possession. Now, the, the thing is, it might look like we just... That's how we create a lot of attacks. But obviously, we are keeping a lot of the ball and making lots of passes. More passes than the opposition. Going to take off Hudson and put on Dylan Wilson. And I'd take off Oxby, I think, and throw on John King. I think to go defensive in this tactic, we would probably go Tom Mason up. Counter attack would obviously come off like normal. And maybe he would go to support. Yeah, we'll go with that. And there it is. It's going to be a 1-0 with Burton Albion. That's pretty good. We controlled the game. We stopped them creating chances. But that felt a bit like, before we went to the pep tactic, like we're a team that can, can control games, can stop there being chances, pretty much at either end, though. So we can stop them creating chances, but then we don't create that many ourselves. It feels a little bit back like to where we were before in terms of the way that we played that game. But it's only one game. 
Let's see what happens against Peterborough in, in, in the second one. So I'll see you in a few days for that one. Oh, here we go then. Same team, but Brendan Hughes is going to get back on the bench for Sam Heller. So let's make this change from the start then. Let's take out Lee Burley from the left-hand side. And let's play somebody else in there who could play in there. So if we go... Who are we going to drop those? The question as well, really. It's a tough one, isn't it? I mean, Tom Keenan's probably the most likely player I'd want to drop. I, th I don't know, actually, because this is tough. Somebody good is going to get dropped here. Which I suppose is a good thing, really, isn't it? It's nice for us to finally have a, ch uh, a situation where we've got more than just 11 players that can play in the team. But yeah, somebody good's got to get dropped here. Somebody that we really like as well. I mean, Tom Kiernan seems the most likely that we do that, that, and then play a, a winger. So maybe Lockwood plays on the wing. Yeah, let's go with that. See how we get on the second game here against Peterborough. Assistant manager says, been on a good run, got there and impressed me. Okay, I'm not quite sure if we're on that good of a run, but we'll take it. We'll take the kind words. Okay, Peterborough throw the ball in. We're going to get a bit of pressure on them. They're going to turn them back. They go long in behind. We're going to deal with this easily. Giannis gets up. Aaron Oxby is going to flick it into nobody. And they're going to patiently play it then in behind. Not quite as patient as I thought they might do. Torres not troubles with it. Plays into Giannis. Into Kwame. has got players with him. Helder goes to the right-hand side. Keeps going. Shoots from distance and it goes wide. Corner from Burley. Whips it in towards the near post. Headed towards goal. And there it is. We'll take that. Good set-piece goal. And see if Torrance makes it. 1-0 to Burton. Howard throws it into Giannis, gets it back, plays in an early cross to Hudson, heads it just over the bar. Goal kick from Peter, but they go long. We're going to win the first one quite easily. Hudson doesn't quite get for the second one. We're going to try and get this down and play if we can here. Uh, they go long. They See, that's just the 2v1s. I don't like the fact that we get done on those when you play like a three at the back, and they probably should have scored. Free kick for Peter. It gets clipped in. It's going to be shot from distance. Keeps going to save it easily. Is that the end of the highlight? Or are we going to see something else? We're we going to see something else is the, is the answer to the question. There's complete space here if we want to go to it, Luke. But you're taking your time, aren't you? And now they're completely set in their shape, ready for us to try and break him down. Lockwood's going to get on it. Goes inside with the ball and loses it. That isn't very good, is it, Ian Lockwood? They go long. I mean, they're just going long all the time at the moment, which is fine as long as we can deal with it and then recounter on them well it's not really a counter is it we can just reset the attack quickly against them because we're sort of going back to the can reset in the whole picture again but uh hudson's in space here hudson go through he's going to try and play this across as you know lockwood now got it plays it towards the father's kwame uh janet's on the edge of the area scores two nil we'll take that not the most um pleasing on the eye of like the way that the move concluded but we'll take it two nil I just don't think Hudson's the perfect player to play in that sort of like two-player system behind the striker. He's just not the right profile, is he? In this tactic, he is a pivot, really, isn't he? He's, he's not agile. He's big. He's more of a unit. Um, I just think pivot suits him better. So, corner for Burton. It could be 3-0 here, potentially, going to halftime. This would be a great goal for us or a great result for us if we can get 3-0 up. Burley, play across goal. Play across goal. Kwame, penalty referee. Held a shoot. Lockwood shoot. But just give us the pen. Just give us the penalty. It's clear. It's obvious. Right, we'll say things are going well. Um... I don't like the way that Hudson receives the ball in those areas. Let's get him out. But I don't know what to do here. Like, somebody's getting dropped. And I don't want to drop Lee Burley. He's really good. I don't want to drop Janice. And this is why this exact system maybe does... I don't know. Like, it's, does Hudson get dropped? I don't know. I mean, Helder. But then that's not really the position that's the issue. I'm going to just keep it the same for now. Like, if Brennan Hughes was fit, I could probably have played him instead of... Steve Hudson. But yeah, in this, in this exact tactic, with, with the first team fully fit, at least one really good player that I like is going to be left out of the team, which is really good to see, I guess, in some ways. Um, oh, my goodness me. Flick's up and he, he volleyed that from distance and then he went in. How I continues. Lockwood's got it. Plays across. Goal. Hudson goes up and it's, in, it's a goal. So, sorry, there might have been like a, a cut between the two sections of that highlight, but I thought the highlight had gone. I was sitting in the bar. I thought it was the highlight. And it sort of came back to us on the left-hand side. And I realized, we might have a chance here. We cross it. And Hudson scores to make it 3-0. And there you go. That is going to be game over. What a performance from the boys. Uh, I don't know if we, like, the goals that we created, I don't think they're the kind of goals we're going to create in every match. Do you know what I mean? Like, there's a lot of, like, moving parts that had to come off for the move to develop and actually work. Um, I think they're quite, like, smooth moves that are going to be happening every time. But fact of the matter is we've managed to win the two games now in a row, which is really, really good to see. And uh, it puts us in a pretty good position going into the next couple of matches. We've got Wigan away next, and Wigan are top of the league. So that isn't exactly easy. But let like for Peterborough, they might start a comeback and they get a goal from this highlight they've got a chance I've made a few changes as well so that's not exactly our best team that's out there right this second Noble's going to roll this out plays it short to Andrew Andrew plays it to Mitchell King got time and space travels it plays the ball across to Carl Andrew into Rollins back into Andrew patient with a play from the boys 
Mitchell King travels with it, plays in into Rollins. Nice. Wilson gets on it, plays into Oxby. He's onside, goes through. Is he going to get a chance to shoot? Oh, what a pass that is. And it's a shame that he gets let down and he's injured. And while he's injured, he can just come off. Wilson with the corner. Near post headed away. Um, it's knocked down. Now Mitchell King's going to head it back in. And that's... Oh, my goodness. We're going to get caught on it, are we? We finally get caught on our corner with nobody back. And they go through and they do score from it. And they have it finishes 3-1 to Burton Albion. A really good result from the boys. I'm not sure about the performance, but the result was good. And gives us a lot of things to think about going into the next few matches as well. Um, yeah, and I think we're going to include the episode there in terms of like doing matches and stuff. And I suppose there isn't really too much else to go over. We are, after those two wins, only four points off the playoffs after a terrible, terrible start. We've got ourselves eight points uh, clear. Sorry, not eight points. Nine points clear of the relegation zone. So good stuff from us. Good recovery. I don't know. about the do, we, do we just switch the tactic depending on the opposition the players have got available? Like, Do we try and keep the playing philosophy the same? Like, This would be the one that I would use in terms of the pep tactic, probably the wing-back one. And I would just treat the, the wing-backs as wingers. And I'd play like uh, the right footers there. Do we use this one as well for, for certain other matches? And then maybe I probably would get rid of this one. I don't know what I'd put instead of it. Maybe the four triple two. I don't know. I no, I don't. I don't know. I'm honestly not sure. I'm still not sure what tactic I like the best. I mean, I I just think that there we've won two matches because Plymouth didn't know it was coming. It was a, and it was a home match. And then Peterborough. Um, I think we just managed to win because we're in a bit of good form going into it. Maybe, but I don't know. We'll have to see it over a bigger sample size. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe the tactic works really, really well and we get ourselves promoted in some some fashion. But there we go. That is going to do the episode. In terms of the next one, we'll skip quite a bit and you'll come and join me back. I think probably around... I'm going to say around maybe this sort of area here. I mean, it's the same fixtures, really, isn't it? So I could probably maybe miss those two. Maybe we could play Wigan, Millsborough, Stoke in the next episode and do like a mid-season review and then it will set you up nicely for when we go into the actual playoff run and see exactly where we're at because... I think we're a good run away from being in the playoffs or a bad run away from being in the relegation fight. And we're, we're a proper mid-table side right the second as well. In fact, we're exactly mid-table, aren't we? So there you are. And that is going to conclude the episode. So if you do like some of the real-life football stuff I've put into the series, do let me know in, in the comments because I've got loads more stuff I could bring to you that I just haven't for quite a while in the series. But we obviously have the last couple of episodes. But do let me know if that's the kind of stuff that you like and what else you'd like to see. And uh, with that being said, thank you very much for watching. Hope you join the series and I'll see you all, of course, next time.